this is this thing is on. It's on already. Okay. Let's continue our reading in the latter half of Romans. So I want to read the first nine verses of Romans 14. Not particularly because this portion applies to what we're talking about, but for the simple reason that the latter half of Romans is an example of what Brockle does as well, where the Apostle Paul makes the practical application of the doctrines he has established in chapters 1 through 11. So I want to read the first nine verses of Romans 14. Let's hear the word of God. Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth, yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand." One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day, regardeth it unto the Lord. He that regardeth not the day, to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not, to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. Thus far the reading of God's precious word. Nicodemus, would you ask a blessing? Almighty oh, and gracious God in heaven, we thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity you have brought unto us to come and study at the RTS and also at this hour the works of William Bracco such a pastoral work, we pray, Lord, that we will not only know it academically, but also to experience what the book is saying and to apply it in our own ministry. Be with Reverend Assault as he labors in your vineyard to teach us. Bless him, Lord, and also bless us as well. At the end, we all return with thanks and Praise Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we will continue to examine a few samples from the first view, uh, the, the first two volumes, just to give you an idea of how Brockle um, engages his reader. Just to give you an idea of how he makes practical application. And once we complete this, which we will do today, we will then proceed through his work in a more systematic uh, fashion. But this is just to, to whet your appetite, if uh, I may put it that way. And so I want to pick up where we left off last time, and that's on page 11 of your syllabus. 
And this is an excerpt from his chapter on regeneration. A very good chapter, by the way, uh, in which he wonderfully articulates that without regeneration there can be no salvation. Without regeneration, um, no sinner will ever repent and believe. But the, the purpose I lifted this quote out is to illustrate how towards the end of the chapter he deals with the reader in a very pastoral fashion. So he anticipates a reader asking the question, well, what must I do to be saved? R given the fact that without regeneration there is no salvation, given the fact that I ultimately cannot regenerate myself, because regeneration is a sovereign work of God, he anticipates the question, what must I do to be saved? And I think it's just wonderful how wisely and how pastorally he answers the question. Do you mean this, he says? Are you sincere? Do you say this in truth and in earnest? Would you be willing to miss all that is delightful in the world? Would you be willing to part with your sin which you deem to be so delightful, well intentioned, advantageous and enjoyable? Is the idea of being reconciled with God, to love, fear and serve God in all godliness more desirable to you than anything else? Is it your desire to be acquainted with him? Do you desire it more than anything else? If you say, yes, I mean this in earnest, then I reply, repent and believe the gospel. If you reply in turn that you know very well that you will then be saved indeed, take special note that it is an inexpressible mercy and privilege that you can be saved upon faith and repentance. God is not obligated to save you in this way. But it is his sovereign goodness alone that he promises and bestows salvation in this manner. Therefore, repent. What, what strikes you? I'm just curious. What strikes you as you read Brockle's response to this question? What does he do with this, with the reader here? And I'm sure he must have engaged his hearers in his preaching this way as well. Yeah, the cost. And if I may put it for, for lack of a better expression, he bounces the ball right back to them. What must I do to be saved? Sometimes people ask that question as if to say, well, what is there that I can do? Right? And he immediately compels the reader to examine himself, to examine his motives. And without hesitation, he urges the reader to repent and to believe. Right? So the next question, 11, uh, that's chapter 30, it's right here, that's where we are. Right. The next question, am I able to? Is this within the realm of my ability? Um, as a pastor, you may encounter that question. Especially with people who have grown up in a very hyper-Calvinistic environment. Where the emphasis has exclusively been on the sovereignty of God. They will ask that question. Well, can I do this? You're telling me to repent and believe. First of all, Brockle says, be assured that it is your duty, which is a fact of which you approve. Number two, try it once. And upon beginning, <laughs> you will first of all experience that you are blind and that you are neither acquainted with God, Christ, the way to Christ, the regenerate state of the soul, nor with the essential nature of true holiness. How will you respond to that which with you are not acquainted? Furthermore, you will experience that when it comes to the point of engaging yourself, you will find yourself unwilling. Your unwillingness is the initial step towards neglect. In addition to this, the wickedness of your nature is so great, sin is so strong, and the matter so difficult that you will indeed not be able. 
therefore sink down in your misery and inability. And as far as you yourself are concerned, be without hope and in despair. But he doesn't end there. So what counsel do you have? Is there then no hope for me at all? The answer is there's no hope to be found in you. But there is hope with God. There's hope for you since you live under the ministry of the gospel, which is the means, yes, the only means, whereby God converts souls. Rejoice, therefore, that you may live under the means and that God grants you conviction and a desire for repentance and salvation. Be diligent in the use of the means, in hearing sermons, and in attending catechism classes. Read God's word frequently and attentively, or let someone read it to you. And, of course, um, there were many in his day that were illiterate, could not read. Join yourself to the godly and request that you be admitted to their gatherings. Yield to the inclinations to pray and to be godly. Shall I then be converted and saved if I do all this? Answer is, your efforts will not move God to grant you repentance, but God will also not exclude you if you do not exclude yourself. You have reason to hope, since God has thus far brought you under conviction. Wait, therefore, for the least movement of the Spirit, respond to it, and be careful that you do not resist it. I apologize. I've got to turn off my phone. Okay. I should have learned by now. I don't think so. <laughs> All right. Be thus consistent in your use of the means and do not relent if time and again you are drawn away by your lusts. So what's, what's your take on this? What do you take away from this in addition to what I've said? Yeah. Even though he at the same time is not uh, Armenian, he still said, I am not able to do it. But he doesn't let me go and say, well, you have nothing to do, just wait on, upon God. He, he holds me accountable. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So rather than waiting upon God this way, he is telling you to wait upon God how? This way, right? Um, my father often used to say, there is a part of salvation that we cannot do. That is God's work alone. But there are many things we can do, right? And that's what Brockle is here uh, clearly uh, saying. Just a w beautiful illustration of how in the middle, right? In the middle of systematic theology, you find this Exchange. You find this wonderful question and answer session, right? Okay, in the chapter that deals with faith, by the way, these th chapters, 31, 32, and 33, are extremely important chapters in his work, right? 32 is concerning faith, and then the next chapter deals specifically with the evidences of faith, and there he addresses uh, all the forms of counterfeit faith. But this is what he says in this chapter. True believers, you may have the root of faith within you. I yet wish to exhort you with a word or two. It grieves me that you make so little progress in faith and trust so little in Christ. Notice, okay, and as we work our way through Brockle, you will begin to see a pattern in how he deals with sinners, okay. Um, so where does he lie to blame for lack of spiritual growth? And what does he identify as the cause of it? The negligence of the use of means of grace. Yeah, but in this particular sentence I just read, it grieves me that you make so little progress in faith and trust so little in Christ. 
You see, and later on, we will come to a passage where Brockel says that the life of faith consists of going to Christ thousands upon thousands of times. That's, that's the language he uses, right? So, what Brockel is clearly suggesting here is that the way you grow in grace is by repeatedly going to Christ. So he's simply saying, you're not interacting with Christ enough, right? Again, very healthy, right? Never do you, you do, you do not find a trace of hyper-Calvinism in Brockle, right? Brockle recognizes throughout his work that God always deals with man as a responsible creature. Always, right? So it grieves me, he says, that when trusting you are so little exercised with the promises and are so infrequently engaged in reflecting upon God's perfections in Christ. So then he goes on to say, while believing in Christ, make continual use of the promises of which you have become an heir, which are all yea and amen in Christ. In whatever situations you may be, according to either soul or body, seek for a promise which is applicable to such a situation and acknowledge it as infallible truth. Now, he later on devotes an entire chapter to the use of the promises by believers. But notice what he's saying here. The promises are there to be used. So he's saying, when you find yourself in a specific situation, go to God's word and find a promises that matches your situation. And then take hold of that promise. And believe in that promise. And so Brockle is simply making this application here. He is, he is basing his exhortation upon the doctrinal truth. So what doctrinal truth? What gives him the boldness to say to a believer, go to your Bible and find a promise that fits your situation? What's the doctrinal foundation of that exhortation? What, 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 can, what gives him the liberty? What should give us as ministers the liberty to do likewise? I think the doctrine of adoption that we are the children of God. Yeah. But I'm now, that, that's all fine and good, okay? That's important, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But I'm specifically talking about the promises. What gives me the boldness to make use of the promises of Scripture, to go to my, the Bible and to find a promise that fits my case? What's, the, what's the, the biblical doctrinal foundation of that exhortation? What's it called? A union with Christ. Huh? Our union with Christ. But what does the Apostle Paul say in 2 Corinthians 1? What does he say about the promises? What about the promises? Ah, they are yea and amen in Christ. Okay. And so Brockle has said here, you are an heir. You, have been, you are an heir of these promises. Right? God has specifically given these promises in his word. Uh, as one, um, I think, one Puritan says that in the promises, God stretches out his hand and he says to his people, take hold of me. Take hold of my word, you see. And so Brockle frequently, throughout his entire work, encourages believers to be actively using the promises, the precious. That's why it's so important for us to be acquainted with the promises of God's word. Okay. So in whatever situations you may be, he says, according to either soul or body, seek for a promise. Yeah, we said that. Then apply it to yourself as having been made to you. Encourage your heart with it. Rejoice in it. And with assurance, await its fulfillment. You will thus glorify God and, will, and with courage endure all tribulations. So Brockle is saying, when believers make use of the promises, they are glorifying God, they're honoring God. Because what we're doing, you see, when we take hold of the promise, we are taking God at his word. And that so pleases him. This morning I was talking to a, a 
a dear brother who is, is struggling a great deal and struggling with, with assurance right now. And, and one of his problems is that he is going by his feelings rather than by God's word. Right? And so I said to him, I said, brother, don't judge God by your feelings, but judge him by his word. Right? And that's what Broccoli says here too. He says, acknowledge it, those promises, as infallible truth. Let's go on. The chapter on justification, crucial uh, doctrine. Brockle makes that crystal clear in his opening paragraph on that chapter. But now he's addressing the subject of daily justification. So he is anticipating the question, well, if I am once justified by faith, do I need to be justified again? Okay, so look how he addresses that. He says, a justified soul, every day anew, ought to endeavor to be justified. This is not to suggest that he could fall away from his justified state. But because the voice of divine acquittal in God's word and by his spirit to the heart is so sweet, and sins which time and again come in between also necessitate justification. So, as you read it in its larger context, Brockle makes a distinction between what I call judicial justification and paternal justification. So, what does that mean? What does that mean to you when I use those terms? I want to make sure we, we understand. What's the difference between judicial justification and paternal justification? In which he pardons, he counts somebody righteous in spite of his many sins for Christ's sake, once and for all. So that's where God, as divine judge, yes. declares a sinner acquitted from all his guilt. Yeah. Right? So it happens once. That happens only once. So what then do we mean by paternal justification? What is that? Yeah, he did. Yeah. But so, but let, let me just zero in on the word paternal. What do I mean by paternal? Fatherly. Fatherly. Aha. That's what Brockle is addressing here, right? So, he is saying that though we have been justified once and for all, right? The very first act of faith justifies us in the sight of God. Once we have believed on Christ, in that sense we're justified forever. But in our daily relationship with God, we sin over and over again. And so he also needs to forgive us as a father. The first time as a judge, but thereafter as a father. It's just like in, in, a, in a family. Okay? When your children sin, it doesn't change their status. It doesn't change their relationship with you. That's, that's settled once and for all. But it, what it does affect is the fellowship you have with them. And that fellowship with your children can only be restored when you as a father grant them forgiveness for what they have done. Right? So that's what Broccoli is uh, driving at here. So he says, a justified soul must always acknowledge sin as sin. Sin remains sin committed against God and makes the sinner subject to guilt and eternal condemnation, even though Christ has made satisfaction for them and as advocate immediately presents dissatisfaction, and even though the word justifies the believer who time and again falls and arises 
I maintain, nevertheless, that sin retains its nature. So Brockle is saying that even in the life of the believer, sin is sin. And when we sin, we're guilty. And when we sin, we need to be pardoned. Also paternally, okay? So a justified soul must see and feel his son sin also as such, and thus acknowledge himself to be condemnable as far as he himself is concerned. He must thereupon confess his sins, by faith receive the merits of Christ unto justification, and thus be justified in reference to a given sin. This is the practice of the saints. This we are commanded to do, and upon this the promise of forgiveness is made, all of which have been shown in the above. Therefore take heed to your actions, be on guard against defiling that which is good, and beware of the sinfulness of evil. This will humble the soul, exalt grace all the more, make Jesus' merits all the more precious, and cause him to walk all the more circumspectly. Yes? It seems to me that uh, Brockholm is combining justification and certification. Did well... So what he's saying, okay, this is an interesting point. What he is saying that in the life of sanctification, yes. we sin. Yes. And when we sin, we need to be pardoned. We need to be justified by our Heavenly Father okay. for having grieved Him, for having broken His law. So what Brockle is saying, even in the life of the believer, sin remains sin. The nature of sin doesn't change. And in that sense, every time we commit a sin, we become guilty. We don't lose our relationship, but we lose our fellowship and communion with God. And that cannot be restored until we confess our sins and seek his fatherly pardon. Right? So this is what the Dutch divines especially refer to as daily justification. Right? So judicial justification happens once. But daily justification, paternal justification, the justification of our Heavenly Father, needs to be repeated over and over again. So, let me ask you a question before we go on. What could you use from the ceremonial law to prove your point? That God makes, has made provision for our daily justification. What could you use to illustrate from the ceremonial law? There's a, there's a wonderful ceremony that powerfully illustrates that. That there is daily forgiveness. Daily reconciliation. The peace offerings, that was of course one type of offering. Yeah, but I'm, I'm talking about this daily, this daily repetition. This is, this, this, there's something that happens every day, repeated every day. There you go, the morning and evening sacrifice. Every morning and evening a lamb was slain. Every morning and evening God revealed to the nation of Israel that he was always ready to forgive. No matter how often they sinned, there was always the bloody sacrifice. And so there was no reason, you see, for a believing Israelite not to live in fellowship with God. Right? And there's no reason for us not to live in fellowship with God. And so we must begin our day and we must end our day by coming to the Lamb of God. Right? All right. Um, in the chapter on baptism, again he makes a, a wonderful application. Um, an application that is based on the fact that Brockle has made the point in this chapter that baptism is a sacrament. And that in that sacrament God communicates the gospel. God communicates the gospel also to his people. So by means of the administration of the sacrament of baptism, God repeatedly signifies and seals to his people the promises of the covenant. So again, a very practical pastoral application. In reference to your baptism, he says, continually ask, has Christ died for me? 
Has not his blood been shed for the washing away of my sins and unto my reconciliation with thee? Art not thou my father and I thy child? Is not baptism a seal to me? Can this seal be broken? Of course not. Thus the forgiveness of my sins, reconciliation with thee, and all the benefits of the covenant of grace are my portion. I hold fast to this, and thus will I go my way with joy and courage. Strive to be exercised in this, and it will greatly strengthen you, that without your knowledge you have already been sealed in your infancy. Yield not to unbelief by being tossed to and fro continually, asking yourself, am I regenerated? Am I already a believer? And is baptism indeed a seal to me? How, will, how this will injure you and rob you of the efficacy of baptism? And it's been my concern throughout the years that too few of our people understand that baptism is a sacrament whereby God signifies and seals the promises of his covenant every single time. Which is, by the way, why um, it always was my practice that the gospel was preached first. I would always preach before I would administer the sacrament. To simply emphasize, to show the parallel between the Lord's Supper. And I believe the word has to come before the sacrament, but I don't want to get off on this bunny trail. But I'm simply saying, my objective throughout the years of my ministry was to really get across to my people that holy baptism is as valid and is as important a sacrament as the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. And if rightly understood, can yield great encouragement, great comfort, and great benefit to the believer when he focuses on what it is that God is signifying and sealing visibly and publicly whenever the sacrament of baptism is administered. And that's what Brockle is saying. He's saying, if you understand this correctly, you won't have to go your way doubting and being tossed to and fro. And so notice, that's what I like here, notice his wisdom, which you find throughout his entire work. On the one hand, he recognizes that some believers do what? What does he recognize about some of the people that he's dealing with pastorally? And, and that you will be dealing with pastorally? They doubt. They doubt. Right. You will, you will meet people. And if you take your pastoral work seriously, you will sooner or later, you will come across people that struggle with assurance. And Brockle recognizes that. But he's saying one of the ways you can deal with that, one of the ways you can be delivered from it, is by properly and believingly focusing on the sacrament of baptism. And in chapter 42 is the chapter that I was referring to, where he devotes an entire chapter to the life of faith in reference to the promises. So he says, a wise and more advanced Christian is more concerned about the wise and sovereign will of God than about the fulfillment of his desires. That's a weighty statement, man. That's a weighty statement. So he's saying, one of the marks of spiritual growth, one of the marks of spiritual maturity, is that God's will is more important to you than your desires. So the mark of spiritual growth is that ultimately the only thing that becomes important to me is not my agenda, but God's agenda, also for my life. Now he says in such a frame, he that is the believer prays, believes the promises, and submissively waits upon their fulfillment. To be submissive, he says, is not the same as renouncing, devaluating, or nearly abandoning the promises. Rather, it is an enlargement of the promise, since it will be fulfilled in a better and more beneficial way than if our passionate desires were fulfilled. How often there is perplexity upon receiving one's desire, as was true for Israel upon receiving the quails. They were lusting after flesh, as you know. And so God gave them what they wanted. But with it came serious consequences. How frequently we must thank the Lord for not giving us our desire, subsequently perceiving that it would not have been good for us. Therefore, he says, believe the promises, expect their fulfillment, and joyfully leave the time, measure, and manner to the Lord. 
you will then trust as a child and be established. So this is by way of introduction to give you an idea of how uh, Father Brockle uh, interacts pastorally and experientially with his audience. So that brings us then um, to a more a systematic uh, approach. So we will now literally work our way through the entire uh, Christian's reasonable service and we'll be looking at uh, certain matters in greater detail. Now, as you already know, um, Brockle was very much a covenant theologian. He understood the importance of covenant theology. He understood how crucial this is to our understanding of the gospel. So he, he spends a, a, a considerable portion of his work on that particular subject. First of all, he very carefully establishes the truth regarding the covenant of redemption. And you will see that um, he makes his case very carefully by quoting some uh, critical passages in that respect. So, in the opening paragraph there, he addresses the question, um, how can there be a covenant between the Father and Son if they are one in essence? Since the Father and the Son are one in essence and thus have one will and one objective, how can there possibly be a covenant transaction between the two? As such, a transaction requires the mutual involvement of two wills. And so, um, let me ask a question to you as theologians here. Right? How would you ask that? How would you answer that question if someone asked you that question? They are of one essence. How can there be a covenant transaction between the Father and the Son? They are two persons. That's the, of course, that's the answer, right? Two distinct personalities. So he says then, are we then not separating the persons of the Godhead too much? To this I reply that as far as the person who is concerned, the Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Father. From this consideration, the one divine will can be viewed from a twofold perspective. It is the Father's will to redeem by the agency of the second person as surety, and it is the will of the Son to redeem by his own agency as surety. And as I have stated already, you will find Brockle to be a very able and astute theologian. Um, he's not, uh, as, I, as I pointed out, he's not uh, a theologian that comes up with all kinds of new novel ideas, but he is very capable in articulating the essential doctrines of the Reformed faith. So then he... Um, makes his case for the covenant of redemption. He begins by quoting Psalm 89, where we read, My mercy will I keep for him forevermore, my covenant shall stand fast with him, my covenant will I not break. So proof that mention is made here of the covenant between God the Father and the Lord Jesus is clearly evident. It is known that the Psalms contain many references to the Lord Jesus and that D David in many respects was a type of him. So he's saying in Psalm 89, the father is speaking about the covenant he has made with David. But this is prophetic. This anticipates the greater David, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Then another uh, crucial passage is Zechariah 6 verse 12 through 13. And there it specifically says, it talks about uh, the branch, the Lord of hosts talking about the branch. Jehovah talking about the branch, which is a reference to the coming Messiah. It says, he, even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule upon his throne, and he shall be a priest upon his throne. By the way, just curious, what does that prove about Christ. He shall be a priest upon his throne. 
So what kind of a priest will he be? Melchizedek. Yeah, after the order of Melchizedek, a royal priest, right? A kingly priest. Or a priestly king, either way. Um, and here comes the critical phrase, and the council of peace shall be between them both. We cannot understand both to refer to Jews and Gentiles. They are indeed united in one church in the New Testament, but not the least mention is made here of them. Therefore, this idea cannot suddenly be inserted here. The pronoun them indicates that mention is made of two who have previously been mentioned, who are none other than Jehovah and the branch. So this is where the phrase Council of Peace comes from, from this particular passage, between them both. And so, later on in this paragraph, he said, this required mutual understanding and consent as well as consultation, counsel, and wisdom. Thus, the Father and the Son not only agreed to promote the peace of the elect, but they also agreed about the manner of execution, that is, it would be accomplished by the Prince of Peace, the branch, who had the necessary qualifications for this task. And then, interestingly, Barakul also finds additional scriptural support for this in Luke 22, verse 29, where it is stated, And I appoint unto you a kingdom as my Father has appointed unto me. And this particular phrase, as my Father has appointed unto me. My Father has appointed a kingdom unto me. Right? And so he is saying here that... The verb to appoint includes the idea of covenant, and by virtue of this covenant he would receive the kingdom. This is expressly stated in Galatians 3, 16 and 17, where it is recorded now to Abraham, and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, as to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, etc. Thus we have here the covenant, the promises, and the fact that these have been made to Christ, as well as the fact that this covenant has been confirmed in Christ. Therefore, there is a covenant between God and Christ. So that's the biblical support that he gives for the covenant of redemption. And then he makes a, um, a beautiful application of this marvelous truth. Um, I, don't, I don't want to read the entire paragraph here. I'm just looking here a minute. I highlighted something. So, the middle of the paragraph, all this, and he's referring to all the blessings of salvation, all this has been determined, and all the aforementioned matters issue forth from this covenant. In other words, Brockle is arguing your whole salvation, every part of your redemption, every aspect of it, all flows out of that covenant made between the Father and the Son. That's the fountain, the origin of your redemption. Therefore, he says, this is an important sentence, the elect on the one hand need but be still and let the Lord work. They need but to open their mouths to receive, for whatever is comprehended in the articles of this covenant will most certainly be given to them. What a wonderful way to strengthen believers, to encourage them, to make them focus of that which was transacted in eternity. On the other hand, they must focus upon this covenant, be active in entering into the covenant of grace. And living therein, they must make it to the foundation of their life. Right? So again, on the one hand, we, we just open our, our mouths and our hands to receive what God has provided in that covenant. On the other hand, Brockle says, this should encourage us to actively engage in covenant transactions with God. This should be our encouragement. This should embolden us to do so. And the, you will find nothing in Brockle. And I, and I really know whereof I speak. I've been through it many times. You will find nothing in Brockle where he ever suggests that the Christian should just do nothing. He does not promote a do-nothing religion. That's not Brockle's theology. That's not his emphasis. Okay? 
So this will motivate the godly to proceed with understanding and steadfastness, neither resting in the steadfastness of their faith or godliness, nor, as one so often is inclined to do, being tossed to and fro when both appear to diminish. In consequence of this, they will acknowledge that the manifestation of every grace and influence of the Holy Spirit proceeds from this covenant they will be enabled to exclaim feelingly, joyously, and lovingly, for of him, and through him, and to him, are all things to whom be glory, and forever. Amen. And so he's saying, he's saying again, rather than being tossed to and fro, rather than going up and down, as we are so inclined to do, Brachel is saying, focus on this covenant. Focus on the certainty of this covenant, the steadfastness of it, okay? And that will give you stability in your spiritual life. Then the um, chapter on the covenant of works. And uh, as we al already saw before, and we will see so in more detail, Brachel makes the point very, very f forcefully that without understanding the covenant of works, we cannot understand the covenant of grace. So that's why he says, acquaintance with this covenant is of the greatest importance. For whoever errs here, or denies the existence of the covenant of works, will not understand the covenant of grace, and will readily err concerning the mediatorship of the Lord Jesus. Such a person will very readily deny that Christ, by his act of obedience, has merited a right to eternal life for the elect. So Brockel is saying, only when you grasp the essence of the covenant of works will you understand why the act of obedience of Christ is as important a component of his redeeming work as is his passive obedience, his suffering obedience, the obedience that he rendered in his suffering. So this is to be observed with several parties who, because they err concerning the covenant of grace, also deny the covenant of works. Conversely, whoever denies the covenant of works must rightly be suspected to be in error concerning the covenant of grace as well. Um, I know that... Um, our brethren in the Protestant Reformed churches are very fond of Brockle. I'm just wondering how to deal with this because they, they deny there ever was such a thing as a covenant of works. So how does Brockle define the covenant of works? He says the covenant of works was an agreement between God and the human race as represented in Adam in which God promised salvation upon condition of obedience and threatened eternal death upon disobedience. Adam accepted both this promise and this condition. So, very important. Eternal life upon obedience, eternal condemnation upon disobedience. So, everything hinges on obedience. Obedience to God's law. And this is precisely what Christ accomplished, of course. He fulfilled the requirements of the covenant of works for his people. So he says then, if men, even after the fall, have a law written in their hearts and are thus a law to themselves, be it perfectly, imperfectly, and in obscurity, much more so would Adam, in the state of rectitude, have had a law. And so further on he says, in an important statement, he says, knowledge of the law and conformity to it is a perfection of man's nature. So the, the, the point Brockle makes is that nothing was more natural to Adam than to live in obedience and conformity to the law. The law was literally written upon his heart. He didn't need uh, a written a form of that covenant. There was nothing more natural than him. Okay, And of course, uh, and we will have to stop you for today, um, I always argue that the law itself... It's the revelation of God's good pleasure. What does God reveal in the law? He reveals the purpose for which he made man. He reveals in the law that he made us to have a relationship with him 
and to have a relationship with our neighbor. And the law governs those two relationships. The law spells out for us what those relationships are to look like. We are to love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength, the Lord Jesus said. And our neighbor as ourselves. That's the essence of the law. It reveals that man was created to live in a dual relationship. A relationship with his maker. And that's why every sin is ultimately relational in nature. Every sin transgresses either my relationship with God or with my neighbor or with both. So there was nothing more essential. We could actually say that before the fall, the law was good news. The law revealed God's good pleasure. It revealed clearly for what purpose God had made man. So there was nothing more natural for Adam than to live in perfect obedience to that law. That's why when the young ruler came to Christ and asked him, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Christ answered, if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. That's the unchangeable requirement. Nothing about God ever changes. God will only grant eternal life upon obedience. That's what Christ said here, right? That's why you and I need the Savior, who by his doing and dying accomplished that salvation for us. Um, that's why Adam received the promise of eternal life. Um, So when there is obedience in response to a prohibition and a refusal to transgress, there is an acceptance of promise and condition. And now he makes the argument for why this is a covenant. Okay? In this covenant, God obligates himself to man, and he obligates man to himself. So there's a promise, and, there's a pro and there is a prohibition. There is a promise, there is a threat. And Adam and Eve obviously... Uh, you know, concurred with this. So we may thus draw the conclusion which we have sought for and found. Wherever there is a law as a condition, promise related to the fulfillment of that condition, signs of a prohibitionary as well as a sealing nature, namely the acceptance of both condition and promise, there is then a covenant. All of this is true here, and thus there was a covenant between God and Adam. And finally, he, uh, we, he refers to Hosea 6 verse 7, where it says in English, but they, they like men transgress the covenant. The Dutch translation is better. The Dutch translation says they have transgressed the covenant like Adam. And if you go to your Hebrew text, you will realize that that is the better translation. Right? So what, what Hosea is saying, whenever we sin, folks, we are simply repeating Adam's sin. We are breaking the covenant. We are transgressing the covenant we have with God. All right. Very good. We'll stop here for today. Um, then, could I ask you to close with prayer? Yeah. Father, thank you so much for the time that we had to, to learn in this class. We thank you for the men that uh, are born before us. Oh, Lord, you used Great way, and that Lord, we, we are so following this fast, oh Lord. We thank you for this man. We thank you that Lord, you granted them to remain faithful to you and to remain faithful to your word. That today we can see them and from them. Father, help us as well to be faithful to the calling that you've given to us. And we pray, Father, that uh, this class, as we learn more about your own problem, Lord, we will be challenged. Special way that by your grace, Lord, you more than form us after your will, so that we can serve you according to your will and to bring glory to your name, to the name of Christ. And Lord, we pray that you be with us and so be our professor, uh, even as we go over the weekend, and even as we will be celebrating the Lord's Day. May everything be done to your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen.